basically, let's start our presentation. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I, I think, <laughs> I think, yes. All right. So basically, <clears throat> why this presentation? Because uh, I recently had a task of doing such stuff of optimizing a solid gradient calculation. And basically, there are some tricks that can be used uh, for this task that are interesting to share with uh, all of you guys. So basically, you can break your brain like I did <laughs> and probably use it inside of your code or something that you will require. Uh, so yeah, let's start uh, from talking what is Sobel operator exactly and where it is used. Uh, so uh, as we can see, uh, here we have an official, not very official, but um, meaning what it is, but basically it's used to find the approximate uh, absolute gradient magnitude at each point uh, in an input grayscale image. And uh, also it's used to find direction, basically. So it's, for example, if you are using something like can edge detection or, or, or stuff, you can use Sobel operator to, uh, for example, calculate basic edges, uh, edges with which you can work later with all of the other algorithm like thresholding, et cetera. So yeah, basically how, it, how does it work? So uh, we have these um, two convolution kernels, as you can see, one for X uh, and one for uh, Ys. And it's relatively close to, Sobel, to Robert's cross convolution kernels that we can see here. So basically these are smaller. Um, so, yeah, and both of these are used for uh, approximate edge, uh, edge calculations. So yeah, but there is some differences. Uh, Sobel kernels are designed to respond maximally to edges that are running vertical and horizontally uh, relative to pixel grid. Basically, as you can see from their uh, initial looks, yes, so basically here we have uh, vertical responses and here we have horizontal responses. Uh, so basically they are applied to input image separately and uh, we are producing as a result separate measurements of uh, gradient components in each orientations. We will call this uh, JX and JY. Uh, and basically we can combine this to find the absolute magnitude of the gradient at each point. So here is the formula that is used widely for this calculation. And as you can see, we have a square root here. So yeah, it's, it's kind of hard because uh, it's, it's slow for calculating. And uh, yeah, and Cindy's also use that <laughs> in, in the next points. But right now <clears throat> we'll look at the Sobel operators. So as you can see here, we have, for example, an original gray, gray scale image. Here we have the result of the Sobel operator and here's the result of Robert's cross operator. Basically, what is Sobel operator? What Sobel operator is, is um, we take the first derivative, for example, of the image and we add some Gaussian blur. Yes, Gaussian kernels. So we, uh, this result of this operator is less sensitive to noise. And as you can see, the edges are uh, more intense, yes, than this. So um, we have a higher outputs compared to Robert's cross, but it's a little bit slower to calculate because we have three by three kernel, not two by two. So uh, the calculation is slower. Uh, how does OpenCV calculate it? Basically, we have this method uh, that's called CV Sobel. And as we can see, we have an input an output and some additional parameters that are being used. The problem with this OpenCV method is that it cannot calculate both of the gradients at once. So basically we need to call it two times for separate calculations. Uh, and it's a problem because in many places we need those both of these gradients at once. And yeah, and it's another task that needed to be solved because uh, it, there is a clear way to speed this up from initial like idea. Uh, so what will we try to optimize? Though the input will be an eight bit input image, grayscale basically with uh, the default three by three kernel, scale value of one and delta of zero. Delta is a shift 
that is being used if needed. Not, not a shift, uh, it's an additional value that's been added to some of the results. And scale is, for example, if you take 0 0.2, it will be scaled like uh, five times uh, to the, so to the, the output values would be smaller by five times, basically. But the uh, overall behavior can be looked and achieved with these default values. So yeah, and the result of a calculation would be the 16-bit output gradient values. Uh, the border values, uh, we won't calculate this because uh, there are like, uh, they are not used widely because borders are not used for edges in all of the cases, but uh, yeah, we can calculate them separately and uh, you can do that basically with a few cycles. Yeah, though for this uh, presentation, we won't use it because it will take us some more time than needed. So yeah. And as I said before, the main problem of OpenCV is that we cannot calculate both gradients at once. So yeah, um, what does it look like exactly? Basically, the, here's our input image uh, that we can lay out as a grid to uh, X and Ys. And basically we will take our convolution kernel three by three and we'll calculate value for example, for this point, yeah, as I written here, uh, we basically take our kernel and multiply this stuff, then this stuff, and we have G GX and JYs accordingly. Yeah, and we will do this for all of the items in a row and we'll process each rows. So we will have uh, these, uh, G GXs and GYs as a result in a separate arrays of stuff. So yeah, here is a small code snippet how it can be done via this color code. And as you can see, we are iterating through rows and columns. We are starting with one and finishing with uh, height and width accordingly minus one because we, like I said before, we do not count borders. Uh, as borders require some kind of uh, like mirroring, etc., because the kernel moves, as you can see, in this way. So, so several values are not in the kernel, so we need separate techniques to do that. Yeah. Uh, so basically, this code uh, is very simple because it does what <laughs> the initial algorithm tells it. Yeah. So we calculate current pixel for better visual like visual, visualization, yes. So we have our pixel pointer. So it's a current pixel in our image pointer. And then we have next rows, previous rows. And we calculate our, oops, uh, our gradients, uh, yeah, with our current pixel. So basically this is multiplication by two. This is our subtractions and the same for Y uh, gradients. And yeah, we have our result and everything's great. Yeah, so success, uh, sadly, no. Because here are the Google benchmarks that have been run on that code. And as, as we can see, the OpenCV calculates this four times faster than uh, this row code does. And uh, that's a problem. Even if we calculate X and Ys, we are also two times slower because this code, scalar code, is not effective at all. So basically, we will need to optimize this somehow, and we can do this with CMDs, thankfully, and it's working. <laughs> yeah, so what we'll do first is load data into the AVX2 vectors. What are AVX2 vectors? Is vectors that, that can hold 256 bits of data, basically, and uh, do the single instruction multiple uh, data calculations. Yeah, uh, so what we'll start is as like, as you can see, we can load the first three lanes uh, into these vectors by using this uh, uh, method. Yeah, load, we, we are using an aligned load because uh, right now it's not that like important of whether we have aligned or unaligned memory because on, um, on plenty of modern processors, it will be the same. Yeah, so basically, then we are splitting the three initial 8-bit vectors to six 16-bit vectors. Uh, why we are doing that? Because if we did some calculations with, within the 8-bit field, basically, if you add, uh, for example, two values that are 200, 
you are you will have a result of 400 and 8 bit vectors only can hold 256 maximum yeah value or 255 so we will need to convert this stuff to 16 bit vectors to avoid this arithmetic overflow so we can mm, process all of our data accordingly so we can, we can use these methods basically uh, this will convert it to uh, epi 16 yeah basically signed integers 16 bit values and this stuff uh, extract 128 bits from 256 bits we can extract needed lanes from uh, our initial vectors so we result is something like this so we have our 32 values 32 8 bit values to be precise and we are converting them to two separate vectors that will hold all of these values and we will do this for all of the three lanes so basically we are result with six vectors of 16-bit integer values that we will process soon. Yeah, so how should we calculate it? So the general idea for X gradient calculation is basically to, first we need to multiply this by two and then add all of this stuff together. So we will have uh, all of the sums and subtractions for each of the lane. And basically, this can be achieved we are um, for example we can do multiplication by simply by shifting uh, by, by a simple shift because multiplication by two is a simple shift it's a little bit faster than ordinary multiplication and uh, we will do the addition of all of these lanes so we have the results for each three lanes basically written in some kind of an array but how should we do our horizontal subtraction basically yeah we'll we'll calculate all of these sums and multiplications but right now we need to do some kind of horizontal subtraction so we have our results and here's when these tricks come into handy because uh, there is a way of doing this and it's lane shifting basically if you look at this and if you imagine that it's our data from uh, like all of the 16 items that we are converted from initial 8-bit vectors yes if we do this we can see that we can subtract first elements uh, no third elements from first fourth elements from two so basically we can do vertical uh, subtraction that we are used to not, not some kind of horizontal stuff so we need to shift the lanes and everything should be cool so basically we just add one more vector and yeah and, and we can do this stuff but is it so simple in the avx2 because we have mm, like 32 elements and stuff uh, so the second parts for example needs to be calculated from shifting the original data and then we will have this 16 bits vector that starts from 15 because we cannot shift the previous data yeah we need to prepare as i drawn here we need to prepare this vector and this vector by separate separately yes because when we shift this vector we will start from one and we can need to finish with 14 and this vector needs to be started from 15 but we cannot like shift these values here so we will need to shift the original vector so this this second vector will start from 15 these two values and will end in 30 these two values that we have like uh, moved so as you can see the illustration basically if you do this shift of the original data we will get this stuff that we need in the second lane basically we will use it for the second part of the calculation okay uh, so again the first part we just shift our original data and for the second part we will shift the shifted <laughs> data yeah from 8-bit vector and we will we can as you can see calculate values from one 
to 28. Basically, we can process 28 elements per this calculation. So yeah, how should we lane, uh, do the lane shift in AVX2? Here is the hard part because uh, the instruction that does this does the shift separately for each lane, for each 128 bit lane. And it's a problem because if we do that, we will result in this awkward stuff that we don't need. So how should we do it? The general idea is this kind of formula that I found somewhere, yeah, <laughs> but it's logical. So you, you can come up with it by yourself. Uh, so yeah, what is the idea behind it? Uh, the idea is that the, this shifting depends on the input element count. Basically, if you have mm, the element count that is less than 16, but greater than zero, then you can should use this stuff. If uh, the element count equals 16 elements, you will just need to do uh, an ordinary permute with the this shuffle mask. That is uh, basically just, if I'm not mistaken, six or something. Yeah, but this formula is, this mask is used for easy understanding, easier understanding from what I see. And if you have like uh, N, greater than 16, but less than 32, you will need to use this. So basically, if you look here, the, the, here's an oligonar, and here's an, an ordinary shift instruction with different arguments. So yeah, but in our case, we have uh, like two 16-bit values or four 8-bit values. So we, we need to uh, shift like for two values for four values in eight bits, yeah. Because a ligand R AP8, as you can see, it's it shifts eight, in eight bit values. So basically, how we can do this? So the permute uh, helps this because uh, we need several zeros at front. I will show you again. So basically we need to achieve this. We need to put somehow several zeros at the front and then leave all of the data that was there and shift it for two values basically so we are doing this permute that can uh, that takes two vectors as an input and can place either high or low 128 bit lanes from both of them or it can place zero all of this depends on this shuffle mask so basically if we use this shuffle mask we can place zeros in the high lane and these values that are uh, like from low lane of the original or from high lane of the original vector into this low lane of this resulting vector and yeah and this will use with ligand r because ligand r can shift the bits in both low and high lanes from given vectors basically this is an illustration what we will need to achieve with our elegant R. So basically, the, here is our permute result that we just calculated. As you can see, we need these values that are violet or purple, how it's called, yeah. So we need to do something uh, to get them. So basically, if we shift for 12 8-bit elements, or six 16 bits, if you call it, yeah. So we will leave these six unattended. Then this part that is purple will be moved to the to this lane of the resulting vector. And another vector that we will use, it's an ordinary input data vector that is also a ligand for uh, six 16 bit elements and we take this blue part of it so basically the elegant r will take all of these bits from these two vectors that one is that we permuted and another one is from the input and place them into a, a coordinary lanes so we result in this beautiful shifted full lane vector um, and yeah as for the cost of this operation the uh, ligand r is from what I remember, is just one latency, and permute is something like three. 
so it's not very costly but uh, it can do you a full lane shift so yeah it's cool um and you can use avx2 for this basically so you we end up with this stuff that we needed basically and we can effectively subtract the lines and get our results um yeah but as we can see uh now we need to subtract uh, this shifted lane, this original lane from shifted lane. So we need, so we will get our results. And yeah, uh, so as a result, we will get these 14 values and we will need to shift uh, this right by two bits. So we will have, we'll write this into the resulting array as a consistent points and a few zeros at the end not just few zeros and then some values. Uh, so basically we do the same trick as I showed before, but with this lower formula, because we are shifting uh, more, more values or not, <laughs> or, or is a high one. Okay. So basically we, we use the same formula for the shift and uh, we get our resulting 14 elements moved to the left part visual part of our vector. Um, we do the same stuff for on another vector and then we have this picture. So basically we will we need to store these 16 elements and then need to store these 16 elements because we can store 14 elements in the uh, AVX2. We, we can do that in AVX 512 from what I remember, but here we cannot do that. So we just override the old data. It's not that bad because, for example, here we have 14 elements, then we move our pointer where we write memory and write 16 more elements, basically with 14 effective elements. Yeah, so we, we end up with writing 28 correct elements calculated per one iteration. So what we calculated like per one iteration that was uh, simple scalar mass. Now we can calculate 28 of those and it's reasonably faster. Um, and a few items that are left in the end will be calculated as uh, normal loops, normal scalar loops, because uh, it's not that crucial, but it can be also optimized. I, I maybe make a separate video about that because that's also an interesting part. Yeah. So we have our x gradients. So what about y gradients? Here you can see we can do the same lane shift trick, but for three lanes. So we will end up with uh, like lane shifted by two values, lane shifted by one value and lane original with original data. And we can do the same stuff. We can subtract this, we can add this and calculate the y gradient and effectively do the same shift tricks. It's a little bit harder because we need, for starters, do this, and then we will only operate with this, uh, also 14 elements from the go and do all of the same stuff. Yeah. So if we look at the benchmarks of this stuff, as you can see, this SIMD version is better than OpenCV version if you look at the original uh, data and uh, at, at one gradient per time. And if we launch two gradients per time, we can even more be more effective because we can calculate data, data simultaneously for two of those. And we can reuse some of the vectors. Uh, right now, I want to show you some of the code and how does it look like. And uh, we will launch our benchmarks and uh, yeah, and Hopefully we will result in the same thing. So as an input, we are generating some kind of image by 1000 by 800. And we are filling it with random, random values, but uh, they are all always like as rounded to 42, for example, yeah. So they are all, always the same. Uh, then we are filling first these six vectors, uh, one for uh, OpenCV, one for our uh, custom for loop, and one for SIMDs, for both X and Ys, to check it them for equality. Basically, the compare images method 
it is just for uh, educational purposes. It checks whether all of the gradients are calculated correctly and whether they are equal. Basically, so our CD optimizations end up in the correct results, yeah, not just speed. Uh, and if everything is correct, we can do our benchmarks. So I'm using Google benchmarks. For this, we should need to include uh, the benchmark age and some and a Google benchmark library. And this looks like these methods. Basically, we are filling the image and we are doing something in these cycles. And for example, for minimum time of five seconds, and we will measure all of these stuffs. Uh, so as you can see, we have the release. Basically, I can launch the benchmarks right now, and then we uh, will come up to the code itself. Uh, so yeah, while it's ticking, for example, we, as we can see, the OpenCV uh, took 234 milliseconds. Um, yeah, our row method took 855. Note that these benchmarks need to be also uh, added, I think, as a repetition time. So our uh, values will be much more precise, uh, though here we have a translation, etc. So uh, our processor is somewhat uh, loaded. But yeah, but uh, this load spreads to all of these benchmarks. So for educational purposes, it, it, should, it should suffice just for comparing speeds and stuff. Uh, yeah. So as you can see right now, our CMD method is better than this X gradient calculation for OpenCV. Our CMD method is better for this one. Um, and also we should be hopefully better than the XY calculation. So OpenCV takes two times of the time that it needed for separate gradients. Our scalar code takes forever to launch but yeah and our xy cmds is faster than this uh, note that speed that this can be even more speed up with some additional tricks but right now we'll suffice with this so how does this code works exactly and how does it look like so we have our input image, we have our gradient outputs, and we have our width and height. Basically, we iterate over this stuff. We use templates for uh, not executing unneeded code pieces and not doing any if closures, so it's more effective. Basically, uh, what I'm doing is calling it like this, for example, yeah, gradient X. Here, I, I call it gradient Y, etc. So templates are effective for this stuff. Uh, especially for high loaded cycles like this. So first we need uh, to process, like I added in this comment, um, to check whether we have uh, 32 elements uh, still to process. If not, we will move for our scalar code and to do this scalar code calculation that you have seen before. If not, if you have se if several more elements that are greater than 32 to process, then we are going into this code. So basically what we are doing is right now, we are loading all this stuff from memory. Maybe I will make this a little bit bigger. Oh, great, yeah. Then we need to convert this into 16 bit memory. Uh, vectors, basically, so we don't have any overflow. Then we sh do the shift of the original data, as I uh, as I told before for some of the calculations, and calculate of the, of the other stuffs that we need for both of X and Y. So basically, we do all of these shifts and stuff and calculations preparations for both of the Y's and X's, which means it's less time to calculate both of these. So it's faster. And yeah, so for the Y's, the logic is, as I told, basically, we shift this by two values, this by one, and this we don't shift. We multiply the middle one. And yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of big code lumps, but uh, yeah, it's exactly as I told. 
basically. So we have our previous values, our next value split by two. Then we need to separately calculate those splitted values. Do the elegant R plus permutes and shift by 14 and 12 bits accordingly. Um, so then we can multiply the middle rows, uh, add them to the previously stored data. Uh, so we can subtract it from other data and we do a subtraction basically and we result with our uh, two resulting 16-bit vectors that we need to convert to 8-bit vectors as a result. So we also use a ligand R plus permute uh, and yeah and we store them these values in our original uh, like um, container that we will use an, as an output, our gradient YPTR. And as you can see here, we are shifting by 14 values for that overlap that I was take, uh, talking about uh, some time ago. So we effectively will store 28 values of data by one iteration. The same one is for X gradient, though uh, the calculations are much more or less. So basically we are multiplying the middle lane by two, then we are adding all of the lanes. So we have our pre preliminary result. And then we do the 32 bits register shift. Yeah, so we end up with this stuff. Then we can subtract the shifted registers. And again, we are converting to eight bit values and store, ah, no, we, don't, we do not convert to eight bit values. We just do a line R IP8, but we store 16 bit values for both of the gradients yeah yeah uh, sorry about that and we again shift by 14 values so yeah basically that's it from this presentation um okay just a second thank you for your attention and if you have some questions or some i don't know maybe something else we can discuss this right now we still have time